Um, okay, so we've got next. Um, I've done quite a lot of work on a series called Meerkat Manor, which you've probably heard of. Um, it's essentially, um, it takes a lot of sort of things that I've sort of talked about before, which is sort of following uh, personalities and things like that into a sort of animal soap opera. Um, and it's voiced over by um, Bill Nye, who does a sort of, I think, very sort of good sort of laid back, rather sort of slightly tongue in cheek, um, sort of bemused bystander type uh, voiceover. But this was actually, this is the last um, program of the last series. And I don't know whether there's going to be another series of Meerkat Manor. Um, it certainly hasn't happened for an, uh, a missed, they've missed a year. Um, but basically we, I mean, we start very early in the morning and we, we got to the burrow and there was pandemonium and we couldn't quite work out what was going on. Um, it transpired uh, that a snake, probably a puff adder, had gone down into the burrow or they'd encountered it during the night. And um, so they were up on the surface and they were sort of, there was panic going on. And we can run the clip from here and you'll sort of see what, what happened. Juno and the triplets have cheated death at the jaws of the snake, but only thanks to the bravery of their leader. But where is she? Rocket Dog took the killer head on. In doing so, she may have paid the ultimate price. A snake bite to the head can be fatal. It was to her mother flower. Rocket Dog's best chance of survival is to stay still. Movement will accelerate the spread of deadly venom. But she can't afford to rest. The pups are in danger above ground. She must get them to a new burrow and fast. In spite of the consequences, Rocket Dog summons all her strength. Too weak to carry a pup herself, she heroically tries to move the family on. Sophie is the first to follow Rocket Dog's selfless lead. But she can only carry one pup at a time. And no one else seems to know what to do. The whiskers are in disarray. Up ahead, Rocket Dog is forced to wait with Flashman. time the adults waste, the more they endanger the lives of the helpless pups. Once again, it's Sophie who finally comes to their aid. Pickle is safe, but this has to be a team effort. Axel comes to Chip's rescue. When his own family, the Zapper, left him for dead as a pup, it was a whisker who saved his life. Now he returns the favor. But as soon as everyone is caught up, there's another problem. Mitch has spotted something in the distance. The family duck for cover. But they need to get the pups underground. They finally reach a bolt hole and the pups are delivered into the temporary refuge.
When the coast is clear, the journey to find a more permanent home must continue. But for the courageous leader of the Whiskers, it may already be too late. <laughs> she did survive, amazingly enough. I thought she was going to die. Um, but uh, meerkats do have an incredible tolerance of snake venom. And um, so she did survive. Um, that was one of those days where just so much is happening and you just got to be sort of um, with them the whole time. The other thing about um, meerkat manor is it's nearly, I mean, meerkats are only about that tall. So to get that feeling of intimacy, you, you have to get down on the ground, either on a bean bag or with a sort of a traveling stick. Um, but basically the camera should be about that high off the ground. In other words, at their eye line. Um, and uh, that is the secret of how you get that feeling of being right in amongst the meerkats all the time. So they kind of accepted you? Did they not like run away when you first No, started? well, no. Because again, you, remember the, the, the chimps and the habituation. That site in South Africa has been um, used by Cambridge University to study meerkats. And it will take perhaps about six months to sort of, if there's a new group of meerkats and they're going to sort of habituate them, it'll take about six months before the meerkats will not run away and will allow you to... And then after that, I mean, the more time you spend with them, the more they get used to. And they sort of completely ignore you. Uh, except sometimes... They jump up on you to sort of, because you're a high point. You'll, they'll always climb bushes and things. And sometimes they'll climb up onto you to sort of, um, you know, look around. See what you're filming. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, meerkats are, are astonishing. And again, I mean, one of the reasons I like filming sociable animals is because they do so much. Um, so you've got not just the politics, you've got the day-to-day -day struggles, you've got the sort of surprise events like that. I mean, that's, that was very unusual too. We never saw a snake, but we know it was a, a snake. That her head wouldn't have puffed up like that otherwise. Um, so we had a sort of a, a maybe dying rocket dog, who was the leader of the pack, female, um, going, maybe going the way her mother did, flower, the famous sort of flower of the first two or three series. Um, and, and a, a, what's called a pup move is when you know, they're going to move the pups to a new burrow. So uh, everything was going on at once. It was, it, was, um, it was great in some ways, but exhausting in others and emotionally a bit draining because we were worried about Rocket Dog. I and mean, you can't not get involved with your characters as time goes on. Can I ask you about that? Have you ever... It must be really difficult to watch sometimes when horrific things are happening yes. to the animals. Yeah. Has there ever been an occasion where you've kind of intervened or you, you always have to stand back from that? You have to stand back from it, but there was one time when I did intervene in something. It was a wildlife for one about um, uh, ringtail lemurs. And um, there's a time of year when there's sort of mating going on and there's sort of, it's again, it's the females actually in charge of the troops. And they, it's a time of year when they often have babies and they're fighting over territory and sometimes the babies get sort of knocked off during the fights. And so occasionally you can find these ringtail lemur babies and you think, oh, what should we do, what should we do? And people try rearing them. It's hopeless. They nearly always die. Well, they always die. And um, because nobody knows what mother, um, you know, was involved. But I was filming a sequence where there was a battle and a baby was left behind and I knew exactly who the mother was. So we could actually literally run and give it back to the mother and it survived. Um, so that's one time I've intervened. Um, it's frowned upon in, because it's, they're usually scientific um, groups, but that was one time when I thought, I know I can make a difference. And, um, but with meerkats, you just sometimes get tempted, but you, you don't. You, you can't really. We were very worried. Uh, the, the alpha female wears a collar. We were very, very worried that I expect you could see the swelling was um, potentially um, going to block her wind, wind tube at some stage. Um, and we were in constant you know, contact with the scientists to say, what do you think we should do? Um, or what are you going to do? Are you going to sort of do anything to intervene? And um, they were basically saying, we probably won't intervene, whatever happens. Because if they do intervene and they cut the collar, um, Rocket Dog will almost certainly not be um, alpha female anymore. So they'll have changed everything anyway. Um, because they'll have had to anaesthetise her to cut the collar off. 
So once she's out of the troop uh, or the, the group for even a short amount of time, she sort of doesn't exist in alpha female terms anymore. Um, so you're at caught between a rock and a hard place on that one. Discourse, isn't it? If you applied that discourse to humans, there would be kind of a scandal. Imagine saying to somebody, um, "My granny's got her apron caught round her neck, but if we intervene, she won't be the head of the family anymore." Everyone would get the apron off, wouldn't they? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. terribly exploitative in a way. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, the thing is, is that I mean, we are we are exploiting meerkats in a way, in two ways. We're exploiting them to learn a huge amount about social behaviour. Um, that applies not just to other animals, but also to ourselves. Um, and we're exploiting them for, for television purposes. But, um, whether that's good or bad, is that's a huge debate. I mean, um, it's certainly the only programme I've ever worked on where everywhere I go in the world, people have heard about it. Um, 